Welcome to Port Life Church. If you're here for the very first time, we hope you feel uh, very welcomed and uh, really enjoy your time with us here with our family. And uh, we really encourage you, if you'd like to stay around after the service, it'll be uh, great to get to know you. Please stay around and have a drink with us. We'd love to be able to get to know you a little bit more. We do not have many notices, if any, this morning. But what I would like to say um, is that we do actually have a little bit of a special guest and, and close to my heart She's out the back. Lily. Hello, Lily. Lily's 99. Lily is 99. Now, she hasn't been able to come all the time, but she's here this morning with her daughter, Sandra. Hello, Lily. <laughs> March next year, Lily. We'll be, I'll, I'll sing happy birthday from here next year, 100. March next year. So it's lovely to have you both here this morning. Great to see you. Um, one little announcement we will make is that the Youth Formal Nick, this Friday, this Friday. So registrations for the youth must be in. That's it. That's great. There's at least three people going, Nick. I saw them clap. Um, this Tuesday, the registrations must be in. If you would like to help, and it, it's great, part of a family is everyone pitching in. Or you, they, do you hear it at home all the time? You must. If you can help Nick on next Friday night, please come see Nick after the service and let him know that you're able to help and, and give him a hand. I'm sure they'd really, really appreciate that. Our offering, we, we have online these days, such as Life with COVID. If you, if you do want to give money as cash, there are boxes at the back of the auditorium, which you can give to there. We do really, really appreciate the generosity of this church. And, um, you know, I was on Kangaroo Island last week. I didn't see many cereal crops, which I thought I might have, but every year farmers, when they, they get their harvest, they don't go and cash it all in. They hold a percentage back to plant and sow back in. So the following year, they have a bounty and a crop. And so we really just appreciate everyone that each week holds back and sows back into this local church. So thank you so much for your generous giving. Okay. I don't want to keep you in those masks a second longer if we don't have to. Um, we're going to welcome shortly our uh, kids pastor, an amazing person who I've known for a very, very long time, Sarah Wilson, will be coming to share with us shortly. So let's watch the bump in and welcome Sarah up. Blessing in, the, in disguise, or is it blessing in disguise? <laughs> I thought of that when that was playing. I was like, <laughs> blessing in disguise. <laughs> that wasn't intentional in the making of that video. It's just a happy coincidence. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Port Life. It's so good to be here today. What a lovely day it is, isn't it? <clears throat> So today, yes, I am continuing our series on blessings in disguise. And last week, Josh spoke about this and he spoke about Job. And today, I want to speak about Daniel. And so the story of Daniel, it's, it's really quite cool. Uh, you probably have heard of many stories that are inside Daniel. And there's so many things that I could talk about uh, in regards to, to these, these beautiful 12 chapters of Daniel. And, and what today I want to focus on is what to do when we have the question, how did I end up here? And I think Daniel really quite beautifully addresses this question of how did I end up here? When we find ourselves in a situation that's completely different to what we are comfortable with and what we are used to. Kind of like our world has been turned upside down. And this could be because of, you know, maybe you've been in a situation like this when your world feels like it's upside down. Maybe you're in your work situation or a school situation, you go, hang on, I didn't sign up for this. 
Everything is different than I thought it was going to be. Or maybe it's because of a family or a friend or a relationship situation. You go, this isn't right. How did we end up here? How do we hate each other all of a sudden? Or how am I estranged from my family or my friends? Like, what happened? How did I, how did I end up here? Or maybe you're in a situation like a living or a financial situation. You go, this isn't working out how I planned it. Or, or maybe you've lost something or someone. And there's an entire part of you that's missing. And you go, how did I end up here, of all places? And I think that Daniel may have had the same question of how did I end up here? See, the, the beginning of Daniel, it starts with a pretty sad situation in that Daniel and, and all of his people, most of his people had been exiled. They had been uh, uh, taken from their city of Jerusalem and they had been forced to live in Babylon. And I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of them would have asked that question, how did we end up here? Why were we taken from our city of Jerusalem and why did we end up in Babylon? Babylon was the biggest empire, it was the empire at the time and it, King Nebuchadnezzar was in charge of that and he was a tyrant, he just came in and he, he just plundered cities, held people captive, and that's where Daniel starts. And we know this because in 2 Chronicles uh, 36, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and captured it. He bound King Jehoiakim in bronze chains and led him away to Babylon. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar actually invaded Judah three times over 20 years. And with each invasion, he took captives from the city and took them back to Babylon. And Daniel was taken as one of these captives in the first invasion. And so we have a group of people who are living as outcasts in a society that's not their own, in a completely different system of laws, of language, of customs, of culture, of absolutely everything They were outcasts in this new place. How did they end up there? They were living in exile. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar ordered his chief of staff to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. And he said, Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So of this, these, it was as if these young men, they hadn't gone through enough. They were already living in exile. And now they had to be trained in a brand new language. They had to speak a different language. And they had to learn everything new. And these young men, four of these young men, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And these four young men actually got their names changed. So not only did they have to learn a new language, a new culture, a new everything, but they got called something different. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. And these new names, they had different meanings. Daniel's new name, Belteshazzar, actually was the name of a Babylonian god. So every day he was called Belteshazzar, and he was reminded... I'm in a place that is not mine. I'm in a culture where I'm an outcast. I am being called a Babylonian God when I know that my God is the one true God. And now I'm being called this false Babylonian God. And that's my name. Kind of sucks. And so as we go through the story of Daniel, we see these situations where, where life just sucks a little bit. The first one was uh, in Daniel chapter 1. And these young men, as part of their training, they had to eat uh, all these different types of food. And basically, the Babylonians believed that obesity equaled prosperity. And so they were just feeding these young men with just deliciously delicious foods and wine and all these things because obesity meant prosperity. So it's like, the fatter we get them, the better they'll become. Goals. Um, but <laughs> So that was it. So they were in this situation. And you can see in this picture, you can see, I think that's Daniel Green. No, I don't want that. <laughs> he he uh, agreed with the person in charge of them, and he was like, can we please just eat vegetables and water? And after 10 days, uh, these, these four young men, these, these Hebrew men, they were healthier than the other men, and so they got to continue living according to God's standard because he knew that God didn't want them to eat unclean food. And so there's a blessing in this story. Because after this happened, God gave these four young men an an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. 
God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. So we see this blessing from this story where they're getting told to act in a certain way and they go, no, we're going to follow God. God bless them with understanding of, us, of literature. Our next story is from Daniel chapter 2. And, and the king had a dream. And nobody could interpret the dream except for Daniel because God had given him this gift. And so Daniel interpreted the dream. And if you want to know what the dream is, please go read Daniel chapter 2. But after Daniel interpreted the dream, this is what happened. A blessing. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon as well as chief over his wise men. Daniel got a blessing because God helped him. Another story in Daniel chapter 3, a really a quite a famous story, probably the second most famous story from Daniel. It's, if you know the song, There Was Another in the Fire, it's based on this story. And basically, King Nebuchadnezzar, he built a massive gold statue and he said, when the music plays, bow down to this statue. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were like, uh, no, that's against what we believe in. God is the only God. So they refused. And the penalty for that was that they had to be thrown into a fiery furnace. They had the death penalty. And so there they are. They get thrown into the furnace. And then what happens? They didn't die. And so the fourth man appears in the fire. And the king's like, what? Hang on a second. He brings them out. Not a hair on their head was singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. After walking around in a fire, God saved them. That's a huge blessing. And please go read this story in Daniel chapter 3. Really cool story. The blessing, another blessing that came from this is in chapter 3, verse 30. It says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. So we have another blessing from this point where they were, like, going to die. Then all of a sudden, instead of death, they get promoted to an even higher position of power. And then there's another story, and you may have heard of the phrase, the writing's on the wall, and I mean, like, judgment is coming. That comes from the book of Daniel, where they were at this feast. There was a different king at this point, and a hand appeared and, and wrote on the wall, and Daniel was the only one could, who could interpret what it said, and what it said came true. And after this, there's another blessing. Then, at King Belshazzar, which is the new king, at his command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So we have yet another blessing that comes out of, of this situation for Daniel. And you can see here that there's four blessings that we can find in, in these stories. That Daniel and his friends were given a special understanding and Daniel was given the gift of interpreting dreams. That Daniel was made ruler and chief of wise men. That Shadrach, and Amish, uh, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were promoted and Daniel was made the third highest ruler. Such great blessings, don't you think? Now you may be like, well, this is blessings in disguise. These are pretty obvious. I heard somebody be like, hmm. Oh, yeah, I know. Don't, just trust me. <laughs> There's more, that's right. (laughs) Through all of this, Daniel was still exiled. He was still an outsider. Sure, God came through on the little things and God blessed him along the way, but all in all, he was still in exile. He still wasn't in his homeland. Yeah, he was getting these little baby blessings of like, oh yeah, wow, I've got power now, woo. With great power comes great responsibility. It's like, whoa, I've, I've got this stuff, but like I'm still living in a land where they're calling me by a name that's not my own, where I have to speak a different language that's not my own, where I'm an outsider and I feel like I'm not at home. So I think the question still remains is how did I end up here? Yeah, sure, I'm the third highest ruler, but I'm in exile. I can't go to the temple. The temple was such a huge part of Jewish life and there was none in Babylon, at least not one for God. Literally every part of their culture was gone. And I think they would have lived every day searching for hope, wondering, hoping that maybe someone like Moses could come. Because they'd they'd heard stories from years earlier This story of Daniel happens in around 600 BC, just by the way. So they'd heard the story of years earlier how Moses came and freed the Israelites Israelites from Egypt. Maybe someone like Moses was going to come and do the same for them. See, Daniel was doing everything right and he was still in exile. It's like, okay, I'm getting these blessings, but I'm still in exile. When's, what's going to happen? 
And then there was this letter that was written. The prophet Jeremiah, you may have heard of him. He uh, was a prophet, and a prophet is someone who has these messages from God that gives them to the people. And Jeremiah wrote a letter. We can read in Jeremiah 29, verse 1. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So that's Daniel and all his people. Maybe hope could be found in this letter. God is finally speaking to his people. What's this letter going to say? This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. What? (laughs) Hang on a minute. What? Plan to stay? It goes on. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them that they may marry and have many grandchildren. So you're saying to me, not only do you want me to have kids, but I'm going to still be here when my kids are having kids. What? And it goes on. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. So hang on a minute. Not only am I in exile, but I'm going to be here for a while. Other, elsewhere in Jeremiah, it says you're going to be there for 70 years. So not only am I in exile, but you want me to pray for the people who brought me here. You want me to pray for Babylon. That's not fair. So let's see what Daniel's response to this letter was. I read in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel prayed three times a day. He was like, okay, I'm going to be here for a while. That's cool. I'll keep praying. And he prayed three times times a day. In fact, Daniel's prayer actually ended up being his downfall. So we get to the story that's really popular. Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Darius the Mede, who was the new king at this point, like Daniel was in this for a while. At this point in his life, Daniel was about 90 years old. So Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. So Daniel has been chosen to be in charge of the people who are in charge of the land. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. So another blessing for Daniel here. He's going to be in charge of the entire empire. When the other administrators heard word of this, they weren't so happy. And we can read on. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticise or condemn. He was doing everything right. He was faithful, he was always responsible, and completely trustworthy. How annoying. (laughs) So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Just as a side note, what the heck? Like the only thing they could find wrong with Daniel was the fact that he was a Christian, not that the word Christian existed back then. The only thing they could find wrong with him is that he prayed to God. Like, there's so many other things you could fault me for as a person. Like, sometimes when I'm driving, you know, I may go over... I'm not going to admit to anything. (laughs) This is getting recorded. (laughs) But, like, there's so many things you could fault me for. Not Daniel. The only thing they could fault him for was the fact that he prayed to God. So these other administrators, they ended up convincing King Darius to sign a law that said for the next 30 days, no one can worship anyone except for the king. And that if you did, you would be thrown into a den of lions. So Daniel heard this. And I bet he was asking, how did I end up here? Where I have to weigh up. Do I follow the law and keep my life? Or do I follow my God? Sometimes I think we can be in a similar situation where our friends or our peers or our colleagues or or our situation 
or our family wants us to do one thing, and we go, yeah, but God says I should love people. Our friends give us advice, hey, you should seek revenge on this person for what they did to you. Then you read the Bible, and the Bible says you should love them and pray for them. And we're caught. Do we follow what everyone says I should do, which would be perfectly acceptable in terms of society? Like, I'm not going to do anything illegal. I'm just going to mess with them a bit. Or do I follow what God says? How did I end up here? Daniel had to choose between God and his kingdom. So we read on. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, what did he do? He went home and knelt down, as usual, in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he has always done, giving thanks to his God. Daniel knew prayer meant death in this circumstance. He's like, no, I'm still going to do it. And he didn't do it in hiding. He did it where people could see. And he gave thanks Daniel's amazing. (laughs) Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about this law. Remember, you said if anyone praying, lion's den? And the king loved Daniel. He was like, yeah, but it's Daniel. He's amazing. Like, I want him to be in charge of Babylon. And they were like, but you signed the law and nothing can go against the law of what you sign. He was like, yeah, you're right. And so at last... The king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. Daniel has the death penalty. And death by lions, got to be a gory way to go. See, they they would starve these lions deliberately as a form of torture so that when they pushed someone into the den of lions, they would be eaten up immediately. Super gross. Don't think about that too much. (laughs) Trust me. Had a weird dream last night. His bodies in, in pieces in, in bags. It's just... <laughs> Don't think about it. So Daniel was just being given this death penalty. And I wonder if he was asking, how did I end up here? I have done everything right. I worshipped when I wasn't allowed to. I prayed when I wasn't allowed to. I followed my God's law over anything else. How did I end up here at the death penalty? Similarly to, I was in Jerusalem, happy as Larry, and then I was in exile in Babylon. How did I end up here? All this stuff was happening to Daniel, and he had no say in it. He just had to go along to the journey, and sometimes we can be like that too, where we're just going along in life, and all this stuff is happening, and you're like, this isn't fair. I don't deserve this. All this stuff is happening, and now I'm at my lion's den. I'm had it, I'm up to here. Why did God even bother giving me all these baby blessings along the way when he's just going to lead me to here, when I'm at my breaking point, when I am at my lion's den? Here's the thing. I I have excluded some of this story for you. I didn't read to you the whole letter that Jeremiah wrote. Remember when Jeremiah was like, plan to stay? He, He wrote more. Go read it. Jeremiah 29. So Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 says this, God is saying this to his people in exile. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. was a letter of hope after all. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. So even though Daniel had just been given the death penalty, he clearly, he knew this. He knew that if he prayed, God would listen. He knew that if he searched for God, he would find him. He knew that God had a plan for the good, for hope and for future, not a plan of bad and death. So I've said this whole time, how did I end up here? I don't actually think Daniel had this question after all. See, what I think... Daniel knew, or he would respond to this question with, who am I here with? He he was there with the Lord of heaven's armies. He was there with God the provider, God the redeemer, God the creator, the same God who had blessed him all these times already. God would come through. 
If you were here last week, you would know that Josh pretty much shared this exact same thing. That it doesn't matter about why your situation is, it matters about who. That's the same thing with Daniel. I think it's a point that bears repeating because it's so important for us as Christians to grasp this. It doesn't matter how we ended up here in this situation. What matters is who we are here with. And we are here with God Almighty. We just sang a song about it. God Almighty. If you've never heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den before, I'm sorry, I left you on a bit of a cliffhanger. So just in case you don't know this story, let me, let me finish it up. So Daniel was sent to the lion's den. Typically when people are sent to the lion's den, they're eaten up straight away. And Darius loved Daniel. So very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God. Was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Probably would have sounded a lot more desperate than that. And he's waiting. Daniel, did you survive? And then Daniel answered, long live the king. Oh, okay. I thought you would have been like, woo, but no. Fine, Daniel's alive, guys. God saved him. Better. Let's try that again. Let's go back to that tense moment. Daniel, are you alive? Daniel answered, long live the king. (laughs) Woo! Good. Glad you're not asleep. And then Daniel continued, my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight. We can learn from this that God knows the whole situation of what's going on, even when others don't. Others said, you need to go and go get killed by lions because we don't like you. Daniel's like, this is, maybe Daniel said this isn't fair. But God knew the whole situation. God knew that he was innocent. See, sometimes I think society wants us to do the wrong thing. And we go, no, I'm going to do the right thing. And then we get crucified for doing the right thing because everyone's like, you idiot. Why don't you just get revenge? Why don't you just do this? Why don't you just do that? Why are you doing the right thing? God no- God knows. God knows the whole situation and he sees what's truly happening. So the king was overjoyed and he ordered that Daniel be lifted out from the lion's den and not a scratch was found on him. Like, you know, we can read that it said the the mouths were shut and I was thinking, oh, I wonder if the lions, like maybe their mouths were shut but they're still hungry lions, like maybe they were still preying on him and being like trying to pounce on him. But no, it says that not a scratch was found on Daniel. If you read any kid's picture book of the Bible, you'll see that it's often Daniel sitting in there and the lions are just like happy and peaceful. And <laughs> In reality, the, the lions are probably skinny and starving and just being like, eh. um, can you tell I work with kids? <laughs> so after this, the king was angry at the people who accused Daniel. He was like, his God found him innocent. He's clearly a good guy. He, he's alive. His God protected him. And so the king, this is really gruesome, the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. And he had them, along with their wives and their children, thrown in the lion's den. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they hit the floor of the den. Gross. <laughs> Hence my dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> Gross. So these lions, we can see that they were starving. It truly was a miracle what God did. After this, King Darius sent a message to the people all over the world. He said, I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. And we know that that's true because Jesus is now our king and his kingdom will never end. And then Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And we can see there, there's another two blessings. That everyone was told that that our God is the living God. And also Daniel prospered again. So at this point, we've heard about Daniel. And you may be thinking, yeah, that's really great. Cool story. I'm going to go read it because I skipped out a lot. And you may be thinking, yeah, Daniel was in exile in a bad situation, but at least he got blessings along the way. 
I don't know if I have any blessings. I'm in a sucky situation right now and I can't see anything good. Maybe you're too busy just looking at your situation. See, if Daniel did that, if Daniel only focused on his situation, he would have seen that he was in exile. He may have thought that this was unfair. Maybe he thought, or he knew he was an outsider. He had a different name. It was illegal for him to worship his God. He got given the death penalty because he was worshipping his God. If he just looked at his situation, he probably would have remained bitter. And maybe he wouldn't have had all these blessings. Because maybe he wouldn't have followed what God told him to do. When we focus on our situation, that's all we're going to see. We're only going to see our situation. We're only going to see how life sucks. We're only going to see all this bad stuff. So maybe instead we should focus on our blessings. And Daniel had a lot of blessings. He got given a special wisdom and understanding. He was given so many positions of power. Because of what happened to him, God's name was proclaimed to the whole empire, which is pretty much the whole world. And he was rescued from the lions. And if he focused on his blessings, he would have seen, oh, God has done all these things for me. How cool. Here's the thing, though. If we just focus on the blessings, I actually think we're missing the point. Because when you see the blessings that have happened... That's all you're going to see is the stuff that happened. You're not going to see the true blessing that's in disguise. And I say disguise because this blessing isn't in disguise at all. This blessing is so obvious. But it feels like it's in disguise sometimes because we're focusing on our situation or we're focusing on our blessings. And we're not focusing on the thing that we should be focusing on, which is God. And that's the true blessing for all of us for all time, is that God is with us. When we focus on God, our situation gets, gets out of focus. Our blessings, yeah, they're cool to look back on and go, yeah, God did this for me then. But we can't keep looking to the past. We have to look to the future and what God wants us to continue on doing. We need to focus on God and not think about how did I end up here, but who I am here with. When we focus on God, everything else fades away. Remember that Jeremiah told God's people. He said, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. He told them that I have a plan for you, a plan for good, a plan to give you a future and a hope. That's one of the most quoted verses of all time. You've probably heard of it, and if you haven't heard of it, you're going to keep hearing of it forevermore. (laughs) Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a verse that's often pulled out. It's like, God has a plan for you. That verse was written to people like Daniel, who were in exile, who felt like they were outsiders. And God's plan for us is all wrapped around in Jesus. Jesus came to save us and set us free from the the power of sin. He came and He freed us from that. And then part of God's plan is that He sent the Holy Spirit to come and empower us every single day. So that every single day, no matter what situation we're in, whether we're living in a blessing or we're living in in a horrible situation, we can every single day be empowered by the Holy Spirit to focus on God and see the good that God has for us. And so today, maybe you are feeling like you're in a situation like Daniel, where everything has gone wrong and you've done everything right or you've tried to do everything right, but yet still things are wrong all around you. You keep praying, you keep reading your Bible, you keep coming to church, but nothing is changing and your situation still sucks. And you're like, is God even there? Yes, He is. When you look for God wholeheartedly, you will find Him. If we focus on our situation, that's all we're going to see. If we focus on past blessing or if we focus on blessing that other people are getting, that's all we're going to see. We need to focus on God. Look for God. He's there. I was thinking earlier as I was driving here today about how God is always there. And I'm not a parent. I've never had a toddler, but I've talked to parents who've had toddlers and I've worked with toddlers and they're just kind of always around. They follow you everywhere you go. Like you can't even get a moment of sanctuary in the toilet. Like they just always want to be with you. Yeah. They're always just like following you. What are you doing? Can I have that? No, that's mine. 
not that God's like that, but that incessant, that relentless thing of a toddler just constantly following you around and wanting to do what you do and, and all of that. I kind of thought it's like, kind of like God, not in a bad way, <laughs> but in that God's always there. No matter what, He's always there. He's like, hey, I'm here. Hey, you're going through that situation. Hey, I'm here. Oh, hey, you're in this blessing. Hey, I'm here. It's like, hello, I'm here. Stop focusing on you. Focus on me. I'm here. He probably has a much deeper voice than I do. I'm here. <laughs> God is always there. You can see this in Daniel. He was blessed so many times. God was there throughout every single thing. You look at any Bible story, any book of the Bible, and you will see that God was always there. God was with them. God helped them. God rescued them. God gave them things. God is always there. and He's always there for us as well. We need to focus on God because that is the true blessing. And it's not in disguise at all. It's just we can't see it when we're focusing on other things. There's two other places in the Bible. There's many more, but there's two verses I want to read to you to show you, hey, this isn't just a once-off thing. Colossians 3, so set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We need to focus on God, not on our situation. And Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When we focus on Jesus, our faith gets perfected. Our faith, it, it, it gets easier. Because who knows when you're in a bad situation, you're like, oh, your faith kind of dwindles sometimes. But when we focus on Jesus, our faith gets strengthened. And we can do this because God is with us every step of the way. And so today, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if a bunch of people here in Port Adelaide and, and if you're watching online, wouldn't it be cool if we all for a moment focused on Jesus and nothing else? What life could we bring to our community if we focus on God instead of our situation? Our situation's still going to be there, but so is God. And so today, what better way to focus on God than through worship? We're going to sing a couple of songs. And what I encourage you to do is to focus on nothing else except for God. Focus on God. Let these, words, let these words be true for you as we sing them. Focus on God. Let your spirit get renewed so that you can go home and you can live in your situation knowing who you are there with instead of wondering, how did I get here? Knowing that God is with you and that's all that matters. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna worship. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you are with us every step of the way. Lord, thank you so much that we can read in Daniel that it's obvious that you were there all the time. Lord, I pray that when, if there's people here that are feeling like they can't see you, that are feeling like they're in a situation that has no blessings at all, Lord, I pray that you will help them focus on you because when we focus on you, everything else becomes clear. When we focus on you, we can get through our situation. When we focus on you, that is our blessing. Thank you that you're not in disguise at all. You're clear as day, you're always there. Lord, I pray today as we focus on you, Lord, that a change happens in our lives, that we can go home and we go, yeah, you know what? God's got this. I can do this because God is with me. Lord, I thank you so much. Let's worship you today. young in knowledge or wisdom and I think there was a really really important message that she brought to us this morning it's so important that and I'm sure there are people here this morning that were able to relate to what she was sharing and you would have your own story as to what's going on but I'm sure you can relate to this and it's so important that we don't find ourselves focusing on our situation focusing on our circumstances and it's equally important that we don't focus on past blessing, current blessing or future blessing. The focus has to be on God. We have to keep our focus on Him. And I noticed as we're going through the story that the key ingredient for Daniel to do this was prayer. 
throughout his whole story, one thing that never changes, he doesn't stop praying. And you guys can leave here today and go home and if something has really impacted you about this and you go, you know what, this is me at the moment, I can only encourage you to get on your knees and pray. But you know what, the good thing about church is you don't have to do it alone. And so if you want prayer this morning, you don't have to wait until you go home. We'll have people here that can pray with you this morning. Let's start the prayer thing now, praying that we help, Lord, help me to take my eyes off my situation. Help me to take my eyes off being blessed and help me to put my eyes on you. And God can help us to do that. And so if you would like prayer for that this morning, if there's or anything else that something that Sarah has shared, please, that's what we're here for. We're here to do life together. And we would love to pray with you this morning.